Okay, so understanding the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you can't see this, and it may come up backwards, but this is a manual that was written by Dr. Jamal Hopkins. Um, very insightful. It's a, a lecture that he did for the Church of God in Christ. He grew up uh, in the Church of God in Christ, and, but I think he's ordained African Methodist Episcopal. So next slide, we're going to delve in. I see Linda coming through. Hi, Linda. Gracious creator, open our minds and our hearts to understand all of you, not just some of you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So I wanted to try to give you some imagery of the type of jars that uh, some of the scrolls were found in and the caves where they were found. So since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, wide interest and speculation concerning their content has been generated. With regard to the scrolls, particular interest has focused on determining whether they speak about Jesus or a variant form of Christianity. Because those that, as you will see, those that wanted those documents retained uh, went to great lengths to make sure um, those of the supposed Roman modern Hellenistic era did not get a chance to burn and destroy their documents. Mm -hmm. So you look there and you can see that they pretty, they had to do some serious climbing probably to get there. <clears throat> so Paul, any questions right here? So since 1947, this was a discovery. Those uh, stoles and jars were put in the mountains to for the uh, for the people to keep from getting because of the water, uh, because they had to climb up there to get up, or they just put them there just to hide them, and they no one knew exactly where they were. Ex from what I read, Miss Virginia, even this location as well, maybe about fourteen hundred feet or more below sea level. Mm. So it, the way they put them in there and sealed it, uh, they were preserved. So you will see yeah. as we go on, there were some that were not as well preserved. Uh, Paul, we'll go to the next slide. So a shepherd, his sheep, and a rock. And I am taking this information from Dr. Hopkins' lecture. Mm -hmm. Nestled in the hills of the Judean desert nearby <clears throat> Jerusalem, the Dead Sea Scrolls were unearthed in the area of Kerbet Qumran. A young boy stumbled upon some caves, some cave finds while, ten while tending to his sheep. Legend has it that this young man named Muhammad Eddib climbed up into the cave after having thrown a rock into a cliff opening and hearing the shattering of pottery. Upon entering the cave to explore what he had heard, the young man noticed large cylindrical potter jars which contained leather manuscripts with strange writings. Oh, okay. So it looks like I didn't put the G on young there. So I've been typing and crack a in here to make sure I got all this information to you guys. So you can get a little bit of an example there of some of the scrolls, and I'm gonna have some other imagery. Uh, the scholars and those who went through these, they had to be very meticulous. Uh, some are not easily deciphered because they're in fragments. Some were perfectly preserved and some were not. So Mr. Kaufman, next slide. So give you a little bit of the layout here. I thought I made that smaller. So you can see where that is in relation to Israel, the Jordan River, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. So they're trying to give Christians a landmark here. So the area where these were found. So I wanted you to see kind of the mapping of that just a little to give you some understanding. Okay. And we're moving on, Mr. Kaufman. 
So I also want to give you a look here because there are several caves. It's not just one cave. There are a total, I think, of there, I thought it was 14, but I'm seeing only 12 here. Mm -hmm. so, you know, this young man, he makes this discovery. And some weeks later, the young man with his two other companions took his finds to a local antiques dealer, Khalil Iskander Shaheen Kando, to try to decipher and value the strange finds. Now, mm -hmm. that is normative in that region. Mm -hmm. So they find things or they unearth something, they understand that there's value to that for the world because it's ancient history. It may deal with, you know, the Islamic faith, the Christian faith or, faith or the Jewish faith. So they understand that there's a value there to finding this type of information. The discovery of 10 more caves yielding more literary remains and further archaeological campaigns of the Qumran site ultimately brought forth evidence that expressed the theology the ideology and nature of variant Jewish priestly groups that flourished during the, second, the, late, the late Second Temple period. So at 150 BCE to 68 CE. And we do know what BCE and CE mm. is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you look there. So once this young man gets this discovery and he takes it, it ends up in some, they realize that, okay, some of this is ancient Hebrew. Some of it is uh, Aramaic. Some of it was in Greek. It was in different languages. And it makes you unaware, aware of the bilingual nature of that entire area. And I only have to point out Philip running alongside the Ethiopian Jew who was reading Isaiah and trying to understand it. So they were reading it in Hebrew. The Ethiopian guy probably spoke uh, uh, some type of ancient Ethiopian language and they probably conversed in Aramaic. So you're gonna get all of those languages there written and that's what you get with this. There are different languages. It's not just one language, Hebrew or Greek. It is a mixture of languages. So Paul will go to the next slide. Is this, is this helping you? And if any of you have done any readings and things, feel free to ask questions. I want you to really have questions and things for Dr. Hopkins. He is a, a leading, he is a scholar in the Dead Sea <laughs> Scrolls. So, and he's gonna be more than happy to answer all of our questions, <laughs> so. <coughs> What do you mean by variant Jewish groups? Just like there are variant Christian groups called yes. Presbyterians, called Baptists. How we practice and the polity of how we practice is different. And so scholars have found over the years through reading these ancient documents that you had some Jewish people that did not feel like the, the priests that were in Rome followed the dictates of what the sacred text required of them, and they separated themselves from them. Yeshua being one, except that he would go into the temple to teach on the Sabbath. So it's just a variety of different groups. There wasn't one consistent group. Um, they would consider themselves one. We consider ourselves one body, mm. but we're not Baptists, we're Presbyterian. But we're, okay. still, we're all in the body of Christ. Okay. Does that help? I think so, yeah. So, you you know, it, it gives you a different view because Yeshua wasn't what they call a mainstream Jewish practicer of the faith. And in fact, in uh, Dr. Hopkins' lecture here, it talks about, um, let me make sure I go through. If I could have, guys... I would have uh, copied this and given it to you guys, but I would have to get his permission to, to do that. And I wouldn't want to insult uh, my good friend and my professor. But a lot of these were written before Christ. Not necessarily. What well, says from... As we go on, you will see there are some that were found. Cave 7 was the most active cave as far as documents, but a lot of the things that were found in Koine Greek, the Greek writings and things like that, they were so fragmented because it looked like someone maybe had found those earlier and you know they were in pieces and things and they were not as protected. 
Okay. Okay. So um, one of the things you will find, um, the purity things, those one of the things I was reading here. There's a messianic apocalypse that's there. There's the wisdom. One of the things you get, Paul, like you have the Beatitudes, uh, which was for some theologians was a little Hellenistic, uh, but yet Jewish in the wisdom of it. Uh, but when you read, there's a, a writing in the Qumran findings that wisdom text with Beatitudes, there was a wisdom text written with the Beatitudes. And it says, uh, with the wisdom God gave him in order to know wisdom and discipline in order to increase knowledge, then there, the, there's a fragment. So that's, it's broken up. Then it says, blessed is the one who speaks the truth with a pure heart and does not slander with his tongue. Blessed are those who adhere to his laws and do not adhere to the perverted paths. Blessed are those who rejoice in her and do not explore insane paths. You see what I'm saying? It's a different type of reading, but it's not that it's that much different. So when they speak of her, they're talking about Chokma or the Ruach HaKodesh. They're given the feminine energy it's due in sacred text. So blessed are those who search for her with pure hands and do not importune her with a treacherous heart. So this is just part of, he included this, so you have Matthew's uh, 5, 1 through 12, Matthew 5, 1 through 12, that's the Beatitudes, and also in Luke 6, 20 through 23, it's a little more compiled um, writing of the Beatitudes, and then with these findings in the caves, you have an entire wisdom text concerning the Beatitudes, so your attitudes need to be straight when it comes to the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of truth, the spirit of the living God. They took everything to, to me spiritually, they took it to another level, another way of uh, expressing uh, the power of who we are supposed to be. You're not going to engage the wisdom of God and then, you know, um, profane someone's name and, you know, not have a pure heart about it. In other words, sometimes I feel like they're saying, don't play with God, okay? And the things of God, but be very sober and sure and, and reverent about who you're engaging. <coughs> okay, any questions right here? If not, we'll go to the next slide. So you can see all those caves. So when this was found, all of the scholars and theologians and, you know, people, they came out of the woodwork to get access to those caves and to those documents. Hey, Patty. Hello. So the archaeological remains have revealed evidence of human occupation, which, despite a number of variant scholarly theories, attest to an active priestly community that was engaged in a non-sacrificial ritual purification and possible scribal activity. The literary writings found included manuscripts and fragments from nearly every Old Testament book. Other literature included the pseudepigrapha, I could never pronounce that, um, material, late second temple period writings, i.e. legal documents, liturgical prayer and praise texts, calendrical documents focusing on sig the significance of recognizing certain holy feast days, texts, daily communal, daily communal governance, and eschatological writings. So what we're dealing with is a group that they, uh, that most scholars believe Jesus came from and Mary and Joseph came from, and that was the Essenes. And they lived, they purposely moved out of the city and got away from the rat race and, you know, everything that was going on with the religious posture and, and this and that. They removed themselves for the purpose of uh, purification and, you know, communal governance and things like that to be more in accordance with the creator. I also gave you an image here of what some of those fragmented documents looked like. 
I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't be able to make it through them. Just saying, but I'm not a scholar then, am I? <laughs> so any questions about that? So there's was an active priestly community. And if you remember, Yeshua, the way he engaged us, we are royal priests. We come from a lineage of priests. He didn't exclude us. He included us, which is quite in keeping with the, these writings. Any questions or thoughts? I'd like to ask one question. With them doing the, uh, taking them the strolls, the scrolls, and hiding them, were they hiding them from the government? Are they hiding them from the other people? Or are they just wanted to preserve them for history? That was a question I thought of when we were driving back. I would say they're preserving it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Remember, we went through early church history and yeah. what did Constantine do when he decided what was sacred text? What did he and the people he deemed priests, there were a lot of priests that were put on the outskirts. Uh, people were killed because they may have writings uh, that were not included in canonized text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I remember that. Yeah. You know, so book burning and things like that is nothing new. Mm hmm. So one of the um, the areas it talks about repentance, baptism, and purification. I'm looking at uh, some of Dr. Hopkins' writings here, uh, and I'll message him tonight. I haven't been here all day to message him to see if we are able to purchase this book. I was able to get this from the ITC bookstore um, that he mm -hmm. made. So. I'm trying to find scattered. So it says the majority of Dead Sea Scroll fragments were found in K4, but New Testament were in seven. Believed to be a type of Ganidza scholar had to make sense of the material remains. Many of the pieces had to be fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. Fragments had to be read, sorted for content, and interpreted. The deciphering process took many years and many scholars. Today, the majority of the fragments have been pieced together and deciphered. So, you know, you have to be serious about your uh, religious uh, craft. Mm -hmm. A little piece of that right there together. I'd be like, oh, well, that one might not mean as much. Let's go on to one that's a little fuller. <laughs> So, um, Paul, let's go to the next slide because the language and the literature of the scrolls, um, you know, Aramaic, like I said, and some are called Pesher, and I didn't look up Pesher. I meant to look up Pesher. I'll look it up. P E S H E R. I went backwards, I think. So it said the Greek manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls were found predominantly in cave seven. So you will see that here. Because again, I'm taking directly from uh, Dr. Jamal Hopkins' writings of, and teachings of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are written predominantly in Hebrew. Some commentaries on the Bible, like Nahum and Habakkuk, are written in Aramaic and a few others are found in Greek. The commentaries found among the Dead Sea Scrolls are called Pesher. Did you find it? <laughs> the Greek mm -hmm. name, what does the Pesher mean? Uh, from the uh, Hebrew root meaning inter interpretation. There we go. Mm -hmm. So it's a group of uh, interpretive commentaries on scripture. Thank you, Patty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The Greek manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls were found predominantly in Cave 7. From the 11 caves found around Qumran, only one cave contained Greek writings. Cave 7 was thought by some scholars to contain New Testament writings. The majority of the manuscripts are preserved in Hebrew. Interesting, huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm that you see that, well, understand that the ancient Hebrew wasn't uh, a spoken 
language. It was more of a study language. So if you look at it from that perspective and you have a group of people that are very strong in their study of the high God, then I get it. For them, it's kind of like when you talk to some uh, Muslim um, believers, they consider it uh, sacrilegious to talk to you, an unclean person, in their, in their language, in Arabic. So they're going to write and talk in that. And even if you speak their language, they don't, they, they say you're, they'll speak English or something else that you know, they don't consider uh, it, you worthy of them speaking in a sacred language. Any questions? I didn't put that many slides, I don't think. But Paul, let's go to the next one. I really pray you guys have your questions. Uh, doesn't sound like anyone did their due diligence. I emailed Elizabeth. I haven't had time to call her to make sure all the pastors and everyone um, that have read some of this information would like to raise questions to a, a scholar around this information would be, uh, they're more than welcome to join us next Wednesday. So the community associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls is believed to have relocated to Qumran after having separated themselves from Jerusalem and its priesthood. The group was bound to purity regulations. So I do have some books and uh, readings on the Essenes. And all I can say is, in order for you to understand, child, they took a bath about everything. Uh, no, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. You got angry, go, go take a ritual bath. Mm -hmm. And they also main, maintained, and some of that is in here, I didn't want to read it, the purity laws around a woman and her menstrual cycle were very, very important. How she bathed, removed herself, all of those things. It reminds you almost of some of the, you know, Orthodox Jewish stuff. Uh, you know, it's very deep and it's very detailed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and the image right here, that's some of the people, the archaeological, archaeological folks digging and taking their time opening. Because some, of course, some documents like this, when they hit the air, sometimes that's enough to damage them uh, and rule. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Qumran is a very important for mystics. It's a very important area. Mm -hmm. So um, for Christians, it is for scholarly reasons. Uh, some people have their intent already set to make it all about Yeshua and things like that. And now the development of people that, you know, Yeshua probably grew up with and where some of those particular ways of being knew the law, he didn't tell people to go show themselves to the priest. But he didn't tell them to go show themselves to these people. Just say it. That's my thoughts. So I have all type of thoughts that just go all over the place when I read things like this. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kaufman, next slide. So this is the final slide, if I'm not mistaken. I wanted to give you some information on the Essenes. These were communities of monks who settled in remote places. They believed that they were obey obeying the word of God by going into the desert and escaping worldly concerns of Jerusalem mm -hmm. and the corruption of the temple. We know Jesus beat the snot out of people because of the corruption that was in the temple. Mm -hmm. They also rejected Roman rule. And one of the things they focused on, Isaiah 43, prepare in the wilderness a way for the Lord, make straight a highway for our God across the desert. What verse? That's Isaiah 43. 40 verse 3. 40 verse 3. I got it. So... Uh, that's your introduction. Hopefully you guys will go. Some of you, if you, you feel the need, uh, you can look up Jamal Hopkins and see if he has any writings. But this is what I purchased in seminary so that I could pester him and raise all type of questions. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, you know. 
Paul Hoskins? Uh-huh. Hoskins, okay. No, Hopkins. Like Hopkins uh, University. Hopkins. Okay, okay, got you. Okay. Jamal Hopkins. Okay. Very brilliant. Um, I can't say young man, he'll get me. He kind of got old now, but <laughs> very kind hearted gentleman, family man, excellent professor. And I was honored, so honored to be his teaching assistant. Uh, he, uh, Sharon uh, Smith, who is now um, on the other side, she was a teaching assistant and we were all good friends. She used to call us, don't anyone get offended. She, when we would be walking and talking and discussing, you know, you know, things that other people didn't discuss, she would say, we're the three Negroes. <laughs> the three what? Three Negroes. <laughs> Sharon was a brilliant, she's another brilliant mind. Um, I'm always heartbroken that, you know, she, she did not live. If she had stayed in Georgia and not moved to Florida, she probably would still be alive. Florida denied her insurance. Mm. So oh, she, okay. yeah. And then she didn't have as much help. You know, with the itinerant type of preaching, you really have to pay a type of dues. Mm -hmm. um, and she was pastoring two churches. And I remember she called me and she cried. She said, Charlotte, I'm working so hard. I, I'm pastoring two churches. I said, well, I'm not pastoring any church. Why are you complaining? She said, well, I only get $600 a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was I was like, oh, you, quit. <laughs> you know, and she would have to sometimes, you know, beg and ask them, you know, I pay more for a rental car and things like that. And I felt really bad for her. But she, you know, she knew she was a scholar. She started getting invited to different AME churches and stuff to lecture and there was fees involved. And she was, you know, beginning to strengthen herself and hopefully you know, get placed somewhere that would give her more of an income. So she wasn't living, uh, without living with her mother and her grandmother, she would have been in abject poverty. Mm. And a, she would have to the dogs a month. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it was really tough. I mean, she would call and talk to me. She said, you just don't know. You just don't know. And, you know, for, um, you know, some of my colleagues and all of us who would talk, you know, we went to school and had all the training for the purpose of walking in the pastorate. And we would be like, girl, why are you complaining? And then till she told us what she got paid, we said, yeah, you need, you need to complain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but everyone knew that there's a, a level of paying your dues, so to speak. And yeah. that the, you know, when you pass um, that the congregants understand that you're serious. You know, you know, many congregants today aren't looking for a fly by night preacher. They're just not. Um, so, and the itinerant, uh, I've never been in that. I, you know, was asked to get into it. I said, no, my daddy told me, no, 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 stay in the Presbyterian church. Mm -mm, don't move. Don't move. So I don't do well with being mistreated. Just saying. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't think any of you either would do well with being mistreated. Um, Cause I remember when she passed away um, every um, in the AME church po polity, they're supposed to have a life insurance on every pastor. So if, you know, they come uh, to whatever happens to them and things like that, the fa the church buries them. Her, church, her two churches did not have insurance on her. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So there was um, an AME pastor who uh, the church had its own graveyard and they gave her a tomb. And, I mean, it's just like, okay, here she had a law degree from uh, John Hopkins. She was brilliant. She used to be a juvenile court judge in Baltimore. Brilliant woman. And she was hoping to do a PhD one day on the sexual laws in the Old Testament. Because she was oh, God was brutal on women. I'd be like, really? She said, yeah, some of these laws. 
She said, you better be glad you didn't live during those times. Mm-hmm. You can be as innocent as you want to be. You got stoned. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because your value, when you had small groups like the Jewish communities and other communities, your value was in producing legitimate children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's some of what Ezra is about. That's what you get. Ruth and Naomi, that's one of the answers that, you know, here you have a Moabite lady that, you know, is now in the lineage of the Messiah. So it's a lot of... um, communal maneuvering and protocol that sometimes we find in our own community. Mm -hmm. So any other questions? And do you think you're going to be ready for my professor? (laughs) I'm so excited. I've been trying to uh, get him for a while. So he's ending Mm -hmm. his classes. Uh, He's a professor at Baylor. And another small seminary in South Carolina, I cannot remember the name, but when I say an excellent professor, excellent. So um, they would always say, because I saw the text and everything in 3D, that, you know, they would, you know, he's like, I'm giving one level, Sharon's giving one level, and Charlotte just goes straight spiritual on you. You know, mm-hmm. so, but, but, you know, he gave me my, uh, cut my teeth on teaching and things like that. I was able to teach some of his classes and it was, it was, it was very exciting because, you know, I walk in, your colleagues look at you like, who she thinks she is? She ain't going to teach you. <laughs> 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 and then they like, oh, she know Hebrew. <laughs> Charlotte. Uh-huh. I have, I, this may be a strange question, but I'm going to ask. With all this happening as of today, were the uh, the strolls put in a reserve in a special area, a special country, the law stroll? I think they're housed in more than one place. I didn't look that up. At least five different museums. Right, right. I don't. I think they the, the writings that were preserved belong to the world. So you might go to Israel and see some things. You may see some in Rome. You may go to France and see some there. And more than likely, the Smithsonian has their part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Because <clears throat> they're not. I'm just. I was thinking about the with all the things that's happening. They can be completely lost again, just like they did. Because you know, the initial sale, if I'm not mistaken, the initial sale the little boys made was maybe a hundred bucks or more, but now they're priceless documents. Yes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. I mean, if mm-hmm. we just had one little pinch of a fragment and we'd be like, we in the money. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they are, they're priceless uh, because they they prove out a point of the existence of uh, the practice of Judaism and the Christianity that also obviously came into the community. So they were not anti-Yeshua at all. Mm-hmm. But very, you know, pro-God, pro the purity and the communal purity that should come. So that's why you get that that it seems harsh that a uh, wisdom text commentary type of thing on the Beatitudes. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I read it. I said, Ooh, that's kind of rough, baby. I don't know if I can meet up to all that, but for them, you better try. Mm-hmm. So one of the other things that says, um, blessed is the man who attains wisdom and walks in the law of the most high and dedicates his heart to her ways and is constrained by her discipline and always takes pleasure in her punishments. Come on now. I didn't like no punishments I used to get. <laughs> no one did, darling. No, I think it was good. But you kind of get, there's sometimes God, you know, you may say, God, this, I want, and, but we can't take that a uh, purifying of. Uh, <laughs> thing that happens to get you to where you need to be for what God you want God to do in your life and what you've surrendered to the will of God to do in your life. This is right. This is right. This is right. So it seems rather harsh because I was like, takes pleasure in our punishments. I was like, okay. 
<laughs> and does not <laughs> forsake her in hardship. So for some people, they have a problem here that the feminine is being used. Yes, yes. I do not. <laughs> And in the time of anguish does not discard her. Sometimes we get angry, frustrated. Oh, God ain't with me. God left me. Did it? And it's like, no, that's when you should be saying, oh, no, we get ready. A breakthrough is going to happen. Something's going to happen. God is still God. And I love mm -hmm. God. You know, God, I just lay it all down mm -hmm. before you. And if I haven't said it lately, not my will, but your will be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and does not forget her in the days of terror. And in the distress of his soul does not loathe her. For he always thinks of her and in his distress, he meditates on the law. And throughout his whole life, he thinks of her and places her in front of his eyes in order not to walk on paths of evil. Together and on her account, eats away his heart and with kings it shall make him see this is where it's broken i'll make it uh with scepter over brothers now sons listen to me do not reject the words of my mouth so that sounds a little bit like the shilamo writings i love this i think it's just scrumptious <laughs> well uh, let me ask you to make another statement uh in that writing, they use the word she, but then a lot of time in that during that time, women were not really respected. And how and how how they use that as a translation to try and get people to understand to get the well, the persons to understand that women did have value. Well, the she, this is talking about, this is a wisdom literature. So even if you go to Solomon's writings, Solomon's going to talk about wisdom. And Solomon's going to say she, she, and she. her, and yeah. things like that. And there are places where the Ruach HaKodesh, which in Hebrew is feminine. When you speak the language, you're speaking it in gender specific. So when they start talking about the breath of God, the writing shifts to feminine. Okay. 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 So, so that's something important. When you're reading, think about some of that. And I've always told you to go to blueletterbible.org. You mm -hmm. can let you go to the commentaries and pull up the Hebrew and Koinine Greek. Greek. It might have Aramaic as well. Which, by the way, Dr. Hopkins studied all those languages for his PhD. I'm like, mm. okay. I'm <laughs> praying for God to get to Blue and Greek. <laughs> Blue letter, say, repeat that, please. Blue letter. Blue letter Bible dot org. Okay. If you, when you do your Monday fasting as a church, we're still fasting on Mondays. Be an excellent place to even start with your favorite scripture. Go to blueletterbible.org and then let it take you through the language and the commentaries and learn more. You may realize there's so much more in you that was attracted to that than you are even aware of. Okay. I never thought about that. The sacred text has a way of drawing you in, drawing you in, especially in the area that you have a need. So sometimes when a text is speaking to you, you need to know all of what it's speaking to you about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, this type of writing is right up my alley. So this is some of the stuff, the stuff about the women. Um, I don't know if you guys want me to read a little bit of it. I didn't type it out. I had to type directly. Um, yeah. I can read. I don't want to get too gory here. And all of a sudden, I'm disconnected because Paul cut me off. Uh, <laughs> he'd be like, oh, that was too much. <laughs> Say that blue letter. What was that again, Charlotte? Blue, blue letter Bible dot. Okay. Bible.com. So supposed to be offered in Leviticus. I don't know if the fullness of it is, or this is a little more from the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
when a woman has a discharge of blood, that is her regular discharge from her body, she shall be in her impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. You know what I say? Don't let me be mad at somebody. I would go touch it. <laughs> Come here, baby. Let me touch you. Now, you got to go away till the dark. <laughs> go Good. Get rid of my car. That's not right, Charles. That's not right. <laughs> uh, so whoever touches her bed, now not just her, her bed, oh, Lord, shall wash his or her clothes and bathe in water and be unclean into evening. Whoever touches anything upon which she sat shall wash his clothes or her clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until the evening, whether it is the bed or anything upon which she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. You know, if I was angry, I'd touch it in the early morning. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they do it all day long. All day long. I'd be like, I had to touch you early. <laughs> Let's see. How you like me now? <laughs> so um, I'm trying to read one more. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanliness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies during all the days of her discharge shall be treated as the bed of her impurity, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanliness of an impurity. So this should help you with the woman with the issue of, of blood, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then I better understand it. Yeah. Uh, she, you know, her torment, yes, yeah, she had a physical uh, serious ailment, but then it changed how the community functioned around her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How people interacted with her because she was unclean. And, you know, if you're on your way to work and you pass old girl, you'd be like, no, keep going. I got to go to work. Mm -hmm. And then for her to touch Jesus, Jesus didn't go nowhere the evening, did he? Mm -hmm. Just saying. She received her healing. But according to these writings, Jesus should have been put away until the evening, until the sun went down. So for Jewish people, you know, when the sun goes down, that's the end. So you're going into evening. So it's saying her... Um, Whoever touches these things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean. Until so she shall count seven days after and she shall be clean. On the eighth day, she shall take two turtle doves. Now, this is after your monthly. On the eighth day, she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest to the entrance of the tent of meeting. The priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement on her behalf for uh, before the Lord for her unclean discharge. That mm. This is where my girlfriend Sharon would say, but now God, you gave it to us. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> not we decided we're going to have this to offend you. Mm-hmm. And this is the great thing about who we are in Christ Jesus. We can interact with the higher God and say, give me an understanding. But it was also a representation of the disobedience that happened early on in human existence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, it, I mean, for me, I started reading, I was like, ooh, they sure wouldn't like all the tampon and all them commercials that go on every day. Mm -hmm. It'd be like them people on TV on TV. So, you know, Charlotte, it seems like the Dead Sea Scrolls were, um, to me, the, the greatest importance was what it showed about uh, Jewish pe 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 people and how they lived, not necessarily a religious text. But understand, this is a sect 
in in the Jewish community, just like uh, the Jewish community. Now you have the Reformed uh, Jewish Church, you have the Conservative Jewish Church, you have the Orthodox, you have the Hasidic. You know, they have their sects that have their way of doing things. Like there are certain Jewish communities in Israel, you and I couldn't walk down the street. They would have a fit because they would say, we're making the whole community unclean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, I wrestle with that, that um, even some Christian pastors I've seen before, they get, (laughs) oh, don't touch me. The anointing is on me. Well, what's the point of the anointing if you can't touch it? Yeah, this is right. Mm -hmm. You know, Yeshua allowed people to handle him, touch him. He sat down, he laughed, he talked. You know, he was one of the boys. He, the women could talk to him and, you know, and touch him and not be rebuked. Mm-hmm. So, you know, th- these writings, for me, they made me ponder and, and re-ponder the construct of my relationship with the Most High God. Oh, yes, yes. Very personal, not mm-hmm. just to me, but to God. Mm-hmm. So, any further questions? Any questions, Linda, Miss Carolyn, Miss Virginia? No. Oh, Linda, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. <laughs> no, it's still <laughs> muted. Okay. Uh, you were talking about people when they say they are under the anointing and they don't want people to touch them. I had that experience a few weeks ago when somebody, I guess, was supposedly under the anointing. And usually they are real huggable and always want to hug everybody, but they did not want to be touched that particular Sunday. And I wondered about that. So I'm glad you said that. Well, according to this text, when you don't want to be touched, it's because you're unclean, not because you're anointed. Mm-hmm. Just saying. That's how, that's how Charlotte's little con over North Carolina brain works. Mm-hmm. Because everything that our Lord and Savior showed us, it says in one of the translations, uh, the word of God became flesh and came into the community. Mm-hmm. Yeshua came into the community. He did not reject the community. The community rejected him. I think. You think about all everything that he did. There wasn't even enough to paper to write it down. Mm-hmm. But he was constantly engaging people, feeding people, healing people, delivering mm-hmm. people. What was more or unclean than going to a graveyard? For a Jewish man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there he was casting out, you know, devils and said, okay, you can go into those pigs. Okay, go. And then he further instructs the man what to do. And he says, you know, we understand now when there's a deliverance and and things, you need to make sure the house isn't just clean and empty. You need to be filled with the Ruach Kakodesh, the presence of God, filled with the word. If you feel empty somewhere, get your word and just start reading it out loud. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Fill that emptiness or that void with the word, uh, with music, singing, So I believe the the Dead Sea Scrolls is is a a testament to people who just love God, preserving that love in any way for it to go on and be Mm -hmm. generative, not just Mm -hmm. for them. This is mine and right now, not Mm -hmm. thinking about the generations to come. I think about that when I see Linda with her grandbabies and, you know, Malia and Riley. People are thinking about the generative nature of who we are as believers. Yeah. Those who don't aren't passing on anything. Um, you know, guys, I had an interesting conversation. I did a political ad for someone. <laughs> I won't say who, uh, but it's for a phone call and stuff. So a lot of people will hear my voice. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but 
I just find it, it interesting that, you know, all the things that we do and we say and the young people, statistically, there's no new church growth, statistically. And my friend said, so people aren't getting saved. I said, oh, I believe people trust and hear the word of God and are sanctified and justified every day. Mm-hmm. They just mm-hmm. like the Essenes. They don't want to tarnish it with religiosity. Mm-hmm. They keep it pure. And sometimes we have a bad habit because we all have been in the church our whole life. We have a bad habit of thinking everybody should be like us. We do. We really do. Mm-hmm. And not relishing in the newness and what other people bring. And not, other than the polity, this is how we make votes. This is, that's one of the things I learned. Is in, your polity is the how-to and the shifting of why you're not Baptist, why you're not Church of God in Christ, why you're not AME. It's just how we govern. Other than that, we're all believers. But yet we tend to in church settings, because we are uh, tend to be inward and kind of cliquish, we want, if people don't meet our group standard, sometimes, you know, we're just like high schoolers. We got mean girls and mean guys. Mm-hmm. 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 People come in, that's not the experience people want. And you know, I said the other week that God is experiential. God is an experience, Period. Not existent, existential, something on the outside of you, but something on the inside of you, working joy and hope and peace and love that should make you be okay with everybody else as long as, guess what? You understand what's working in them is working for their good, not yours. Mm-hmm. That's just it. The church yeah. has to conform you to work to their good and not God's good in your life. And that yeah. just looks differently for everyone. That's my belief. And, you know, she just, she was like, what? I said, there are plenty of believers Mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. God said, I'm going to have 3,000 people in the eschatological writings. that have never had mine, haven't uh, been uh, sexually active. 3,000 people that are going to show up and come out of the woodwork and never had a beer and nothing else. And they're going to be prophets all over. That's in your book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So where they at? 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 So, so, and you know what? And I used to think, because I grew up in the country hood, who goes their whole life and don't have a drink? <laughs> yeah, <this is> right. <laughs> you know, because I remember the first time I had a drink, I thought it was ice water in the refrigerator and it was moonshine. Oh my. <laughs> You know, it was in that glass jar, and it just looked like, ooh. I was, bleh, I was heaving. My grandmother was fussing at my granddaddy. She may have heaved him, too. <laughs> like, why would you put that in the refrigerator? He said, well, I wanted it to get cold. <laughs> so, but I never could fathom someone who never had wine or strong drink even touch their mouth. But that's in the text. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I hope, see, for me, this is the type of conversation I would have with Sharon and Cece and everyone. And we, it just stretched us and, and caused the vision of God within us to grow and, and to, to take a fullness of shape more when we delved into these type of writings. So if I find some links and things, I will email them so everyone can read. Uh, call your friends. Uh, let them know that Dr. Hopkins is going to be on. I spoke with Angela. And she told me when Paul does the link to send her the link. And she said she would like to hear uh, about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so shout out to Angela Brown. Thank you for the, the tip of baby. <laughs> <John. laughs> so, um, but I pray this has added a blessing. And I it has. It, it has. It really has. It causes, it causes you to think. I like thinking people. Mm-hmm. If there are no further questions, 
Um, and write down this week any questions you may have next week. Don't shy away. Dr. Hopkins is a very bright, spiritual man. He can take it. Will we be on more than an hour next week? I'm thinking may, if questions, hopefully, you know, some of my colleagues like Colleen and Connie and some of them show up because this is it's really a master's level information that he can present. And yeah, I'm hoping it will go mat minimum an hour.